All right, guys, welcome to Beyond the Mat. Thank you for joining us today. Wherever you may be, we are here to do some WrestleMania backlash predictions after a pretty underwhelming SmackDown, if you ask me. I'm flanked by my two tag team partners today, the monster of the midway, Kyle, and the demon of the deep south, Chris. How you doing, Kyle? Doing fantastic. How you doing, Matt? I'm hanging in there, man. A little bit tired. Expecting to have hopefully a good pay per view tomorrow. Also, it's Mother's Day, so got to do a lot for the wife and stuff like that. How you doing, Chris? I'm doing good. Um, how about yourself? You know, I heard you say something about Mother's Day, so I just want to give a shout out to all the mothers out there. Happy Mother's Day. Been wrapping up, getting my mom a few things for tomorrow, my grandma. So. Looking forward to that, but mostly looking forward to backlash. Yep, sounds good, man. Yeah, I'm pretty stressful around the house. My wife's got a tough job being a stay-at-home mom, so trying to do something nice for her. Don't even know what it is yet. She's out for the day, so I'll figure that out sometime before she gets home. But anyway, um, we got the backlash card coming up here. Before we get into that, we did have SmackDown last night. I think a lot of us thought that we would get some additional stipulations or additional matches added on that SmackDown. That did not happen at all. All we got was what you would expect from a go-home show, which was some additional heat and additional hype around the matches that they already have scheduled. We saw Ronda Rousey and Charlotte Flair heat up their match a little bit, which it was a desperate need of because their feud has been god-awful so far, out of the ring at least. You can say what you want about the WrestleMania match. I wasn't a huge fan of it, but again, I believe that they are better competitors than that, and we could see something better at Backlash. Then we saw the RK Bro or RK Mick Bro, whatever we're calling it now, with McIntyre involved, square off with the Usos and Reigns to give us a preview of that. Baby faces stood tall there. A couple other things happened. We saw Lacey Evans for the first time. It was a little bit strange the way that after these promos that are pretty well done as far as the meat of them, but the execution of them, in my in my opinion, is not very well done at all because to me it feels very heavy-handed it ends with the same catchphrase every single time michael cole sets it up very cheaply every time and then we have the ring announcer telling the crowd to give her a baby face reaction as if she's introducing a freaking heel and i don't understand that part with lacey evans at all but that has nothing to do with backlash so who the hell cares my point is we had SmackDown. We thought some things were going to happen. It didn't. How would you guys feel about SmackDown last night before we get into Backlash? Kyle, you go ahead first. It's pretty mediocre. You know, the, there was a little bit of wrestling that I liked, but overall, I don't think it had a match that I was like, oh, I'm going to remember that forever. Uh, but there is some fun stuff. Like it was fun watching Shinsuke and Sami Zayn have a match. They're great workers. They worked well together. So I, I enjoyed that. Although it had a crappy ending. So I enjoyed it right up, right up until the end. There's some okay promos, but nothing that also that made me say, I'll remember that forever. It was, it was pretty fun at the end though, when they were doing that um, acknowledgement segment where Drew and Randy and Riddle were like, I acknowledge this. I acknowledge that they had me going. That's so that was pretty, Pretty good and they did leave on a good note with the usos coming down and trying to beat down riddle and drew and um randy but the baby faces stood tall in the end so some would assume that means that the bloodline will be winning at backlash but we'll get to that a little bit later when we get to our predictions so you know there's some good things some bad things kind of mediocre overall all right, man. How about you, Chris? Um, for the most part, I really like enjoyed the tables match. Actually, I thought it was pretty funny how Bush came from uh, under the ring, and like after you know McAfee hyping it up that he was <clears throat> at Coachella or whatever. So I thought that was that was entertaining seeing him again because I, I enjoy his like work in the ring and stuff like that. And then with the closing segment, you know, I liked how the baby faces came out. They were doing the whole acknowledge, like acknowledging each other thing and 
it was just, I thought that was pretty interesting and, you know, taking some shots at Roman and then Roman came out and looked pretty pissed off about it. So, <clears throat> but besides that, that's really much all I really took away from the show. And then besides the fact that um, they announced that a women's tag match is for next week, which I don't understand why they just couldn't put it on the, on the PLE that we're getting, but it is what it is. Yeah, you know what it feels like, man? It feels like with the women's tag belts, they're really trying to make that like a TV title and really trying to push that on TV a lot rather than have it on these low-level pay-per-views. I mean, at least if it makes the big four pay-per-views, for me, it needs to make those, and that's acceptable. If it misses a backlash or hell in a cell here and there, I'm okay with it. But at the same time, given who's holding the titles right now and given the fact that they're holding them to enhance that division and to bring some fucking attention to it i agree that there should be a title match on this backlash show i don't understand why now i'm not upset because i'm going to smackdown next week and i'll be able to see that match in person but no women's matches other than the i quit match is a little bit egregious in my opinion especially just a week after Becky Lynch opened her mouth and blasted AEW for not using their women enough. Well, WWE's having a fucking pay-per-view with six matches on it, and only one of them has any ladies in it. And to be honest with you, it's the least of all the ladies' feuds that anybody gives a fuck about. So I really have a problem with the fact that we didn't get anything else with the women, but there's nothing I can do about it they can always decide to announce something on social media or announce something on the pre-show itself, but I don't see that happening. That'd be way fucking too convenient for me. But anyway, I think everybody knows what I felt about SmackDown last night. At this point, I really felt like they should have added some more stuff. But, you know, you mentioned how Roman Reigns looked pissed off, and he did. Another guy that looked pissed off was Happy Corbin. And I think he plays the roles they give him well. Say what you want about his gimmicks. Most of them suck. But the guy puts everything he has into everything. I got to respect him for that. You know, his segments are usually the bane of my existence because they're so poorly written. And I'm just not into some of the humor stuff that they try to do. But I felt like Madcap and Happy Corbin had an interaction that made it feel like a fight should happen between the two of them because up to this point, it just felt like two high school kids that didn't want to be friends for a couple weeks or something like that. And now it seems like somebody's really pissing somebody off. They still need to drop the madcap crap and they still need to move happy Corbett into something else. And I think that's what they're going to be doing. But other than that, I don't have much else to say about SmackDown. I know the crowd there was pretty into it. I've spoken to a couple people who were at the national Coliseum last night and they said that it was pretty good. They said that the crowd was hot, not like super hot, but pretty hot almost the whole time that they're in the stuff. So it's nice that those fans got a good show, but I felt like the SmackDown show itself was way like too poorly paced. You got so many recapping segments, not enough matches happening. Yeah, I counted them. There was 10 recap segments. 10. Only? I thought there was more. <laughs> no, I'm talking about just recaps in general, not like a recap of what already happened on the show. I mean, like a recap of previous shows. I didn't count like when they do a a, a recap of what you just saw 10 minutes ago. Oh, because, yeah, we would have went well into the 30s if you did that. Yeah, that's like 10 video recaps of Edge and AJ from three weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, it's just... I I don't understand it, man. It's I, too much. I get it for the for people that don't tune in all the time, but I don't know. I don't even want to. I guess get that's what it. you expect. The you know two nights before a premium live of a live event, you gotta gotta get everybody caught up to speed. This would be the time that I would expect this kind of stuff. I just hope that you know every other episode doesn't have that much recap, but they do. Yeah, I I do expect it at a go home show for them to recap a lot of things to remind people of things. That being said, on Backlash, we're going to see the same set of packages before every single match. Oh, and yeah. that's one of the reasons why I 
when I buy tickets to shows, if it's a go home show, I'm a little bit um, hesitant to buy the tickets because I know that the show's going to end up being a recap of everything that's happened up to then and it's going to hamper their ability to have time to actually give me good wrestling or good segments or whatever. And so next week I'm going to SmackDown after a premium live event. And of course, we're probably going to see, oh, well, this happened on Backlash. We got to show you again, even though if you fucking bought a ticket to this event, I'm pretty sure you probably watch Backlash and don't need to see this, but we'll show you anyway. So I'll see all that crap, but I'll probably see more new shit than somebody who went to this show tonight saw. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, let's get into the backlash car here. Did you guys feel like there's anything missing or anything should be added to it? Women's matches, like you said. There's only one? You've got several feuds that you could have had a match or at least something going on. I don't know. What's Bianca doing? Why I give her a match, maybe a non-title match, but have her on there. Why not? What what about uh um what about beyond I'm sorry, uh Becky and Asuka? They just started a feud. How come they're not on there? What about Rhea and Liv? They just started their feud, their program. Why aren't they on there? I what about Sonia Deville and her tactics, her crappy tactics of using her power to try to get over like there's so many possibilities in the women's division right now and they only have one match it just doesn't make sense that's that's my biggest gripe with this whole backlash card how about you chris i think would have to be the fact that there's only one title match on a premium live event that's just i think that's unacceptable and not saying that everything has to be for a title you know i like things that are built up storyline wise and have like you know like a grudge match or a personal feud but at the same time it's like people that are paying decent amount of money to go to this live event premium live event and just one title match on the card is just kind of underwhelming in my opinion so that's what i have to say about it yeah where's the u.s title where's the intercontinental title i totally agree with you exactly where the fuck was even ricochet period last night wasn't even on the damn show any uh pre-show matches yet no i mean that's what i'm saying we haven't heard anything about a pre-show match i wouldn't put it past them to move one of the six matches that's on the card to the pre-show and only give them five fucking matches in the main actual live event which is fine because we all know edge and styles are probably going to take up 35 minutes in their match selling half of the time and the Rhodes and Rollins match should take a lot of time. So, you know, and, and this isn't a big Omos paper. And Lashley don't take a long time because if they do, I fear for Lashley's life. <laughs> well, if it takes a long time, that means that they're probably stretching Lashley out of there after he gets his head busted against a turnbuckle by Omos or yep. something because I don't see any reason why that match should go more than 10 minutes. And I don't see any reason why Lashley should win either, to be honest with you, because if he wins, then what the hell's the point of him already have beating Omos? Oh, they might as well fire Omos. There's no mystique to him anymore. What's the point of him having this dickhead manager and MVP if it can't help him win a match? So, But we're getting into the card there. So we all believe that it's a little bit lacking in the title picture and a little bit lacking for the ladies. A lot lacking. Yeah. So starting out here, let's just start out with one of the probably, I guess, the only title match on the card and the only ladies match on the card. We'll go ladies first. Flair and Rousey, you know, they've tried to use Gulak in here to get some heat. They've tried to do these beat the clock challenges, which are just stupid as hell because they don't make any sense and they make their opponent look terrible. They've done having Aaliyah come out there with no entrance to SmackDown. They had her out there at 7.55 last night, standing there waiting for SmackDown to start. Didn't even give her a TV entrance. Had her basically take a cheap shot so Ronda Rousey could come out and get a baby face reaction, which was probably the biggest reaction I've seen for Rousey since the Royal Rumble. 
She's been an absolute robot behind the microphone. It's almost been disrespectful to Charlotte Flair that she's in a feud with somebody who won't even hold up their end of the bargain as a freaking baby face. I feel like Charlotte's really come out of this looking like she's had to carry it. I feel bad for her because unlike a lot of people who I hear bash Charlotte, I think that she's really good. I think that she deserves better opponents in this. Now, people like Naomi, people like Sasha Banks, they deserve to be in the position that Rousey's in because they wouldn't be treating it this way. Now, we had them do the match at WrestleMania. Flair ended up winning after a ref bump distracted the ref from being able to see Charlotte tapping out. So we know that Ronda can make her tap out. We also know that Ronda can score a pinfall because she did have a pinfall that should have won the match, except Charlotte had her leg on the rope. I feel like this is going to have a lot of weapons involved. I always get afraid with I quit matches, what they're going to do with the finish, because the first or second I quit match I ever saw in person was The Rock and Mankind, and that one ended with them playing that shit over the loudspeaker. I really don't know where they're going with this. I'm starting to gain the feeling that Flair might actually go over here, but again, this is a feud that I can see going to the hell in a cell. But before I tell you my prediction, how do you feel about it, Kyle? Well, just a couple of quick notes about what I saw on SmackDown, and then I'll give you my uh, prediction for the match. But I thought it was uh, really weird that we got almost a fight, almost a, a complete match without a pin or a, an ending between Charlotte and Ronda to open SmackDown. I mean, the match between Charlotte and Aaliyah was you could say maybe a minute 30 seconds tops and then Rhonda comes in and they fight for about seven minutes <laughs> and they fight each other. They fight all the um, referees or whatever you want to call them, trying to pull them off of each other. And nobody can stop these women from attacking each other. And there's just mayhem and craziness going on in the ring. It was fun to watch, but it was, it was long. I was really surprised. And I, I was assuming that because this is a championship match on, on backlash, that this might be our closer. Maybe they'll open with the six man tag team match that involves the Usos and RK bro and uh, Drew McIntyre and Roman. But I don't know, like that was, that was a long time for them to just beat each other up in the middle of the ring. But at the end of it there, nobody really stood tall. You know, you, you didn't have Charlotte or Rhonda standing tall in the ring afterwards. So it's hard to decide who's going to win, but it seems like Rhonda is going to be the person that takes this win. Cause it's hard to assume that Rhonda would say the words I quit. You know, if you're trying to build this character of the baddest woman on earth and, and uh, she's a previous UFC fighter, winning championships, by the way, in UFC, not just a fighter, but, you know, the best. So if she's supposed to be that kind of character, I don't know if her character can say the words I quit. I don't know if it's just built into her character. So I have Ronda winning this and taking the championship title from Charlotte. And then I think Charlotte's going to move on to Lacey Evans. But there was an interesting line I want to point out in SmackDown at the end during Lacey Evans um, promote promo that she had. I believe she said something about um, winning the SmackDown women's champion, the uh, championship. So she might be trying to go after whoever the current title is. And if that's Rhonda, then you'd have two baby faces going up against each other. So that kind of made me double guess myself about Charlotte losing the title. Cause if Lacey's going to go for the title, then Charlotte has to have it, but I'm still going to say Rhonda's winning this one, even with that fact, because I, again, I just can't see Rhonda saying I quit. Uh, what do you guys think? Well, first of all, I don't think there's any way they're inserting Lacey Evans immediately into a title feud. I think that would be a colossal mistake. They need to make sure that she's actually a credible baby face before they do anything like that. But I did hear her say that, and that's why all the reasons I just said is why I think that was a dumb comment to add to the end of it. Because now all of a sudden she's got this mission of being champion, which of course everybody in there should want to be champion. But anyway, I'm going to save my prediction for a minute. 
Chris, how do you feel about this match? So, like you guys, like like you were saying, uh, Kyle, it could it could go either way from the way that SmackDown left off. Um, with the overall feud, I haven't been a fan since it honestly since it started. I'm not a I'm not a big fan of Ronda. I think she's not not very good on the mic. Right there. Um, <laughs> I'm very limited in the ring because of her her background and you know UFC and stuff like that. But I, I I'm gonna agree with you and say that I think that Ronda's gonna win. I don't I not don't can't whatever. I don't believe that she could even go ahead and say that uh, that she quits. Um, for the main reasoning that why bring her in to lose twice? And I think she's very, you know, she's very prideful and, you know, she she calls herself the baddest woman on the planet. So I just can't see her saying the words I quit. So with that being said, my pick's going to have to go for uh, Ronda Rousey to win the SmackDown championship, as she would say. So, <laughs> yeah, she doesn't even know what the hell the title is called. So for me. I've gone back and forth with this. I do agree with the idea that, you know, you think about the business aspect of it. Why the hell would they pay Rousey all this money to bring her in here and lose? I can answer that by saying it helps build Charlotte Flair even stronger than she already is. However, why the hell do you need to build Charlotte Flair with anybody? She's already one of the best or the best in the world, whoever you are. You know, depending on who you are, your opinion of that's going to be what it is. But for me, this match is one that I see going to the Hell in the Cell. I see Rousey winning it, and I see Flair challenging her to the Hell in the Cell match. I see Rousey retaining at Hell in a Cell and Flair going away for a while because that's been a heavily rumored thing that Flair is due vacation time soon. Um I'm really not sure about this on, you know, for, we have six matches here. So my most confident match, I would assign six confidence points to my least confidence match. I would assign one and this would be my least confident pick, but I think that flair is going to lose here to Rousey somehow. I don't know how they're going to do it. I can't see how the finish would work. I'm sure there's going to be lots of weapons involved. Uh, let me ask you guys, do you think anybody's going to interfere? No, I don't think so. I, don't, I mean, there might be some shenanigans with Drew Gulak, but I don't. I wouldn't call it an interference per se. I think maybe Ronda wins because, uh, I don't know, Charlotte assumes that Drew doesn't, hear her say i quit or something like that i don't know that's the only thing i can think of as far as involvement goes but i don't think any other wrestlers are going to get involved so you think gulak somehow is going to get announced as the guest referee after all maybe on the pre-show i mean i i don't think guest referee he might just be the timekeeper again okay he might just have some kind of involvement uh, outside of the you know not in the ring as a ref but outside of the ring and I totally agree with that. I think if it was going to be somebody interfering with it, I think it would be Gulag. Maybe, you know, like if he was going to be the referee, I could see some shenanigans going on there. But with him being the timekeeper, maybe a distraction. But then it's like, do you really want Ronda to win? Not even like on a distraction because it's a night quit, but like some trickery going on there. Who knows? They, but personally, I don't think it's going to be like another wrestler. It would be, it would be Gulag making the interference in any way yep maybe the maybe we'll see like a special promotion by the my pillow guy and ronda rousey teaming up because they're so good at you know helping people get good sleep so i don't know that might happen <laughs> yeah i don't i don't see <laughs> i God, i don't, ronda, I don't see ronda another rousey wrestler getting sleep. involved i i think if anything it's going to be gulak screwing something up which then gives flair reason to keep this thing going unfortunately for all of us we had to continue to see rousey and flair feud for another month but i don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that flair could win this match and rousey could literally go home i mean you never know what decisions have been made within her own head and within the the company since they signed her they may have signed her with one intention and pivoted to another we've seen them pivot out of all kinds of shit. so who the hell knows but we're all going with rousey here 
How many confidence points do each of you have on a scale of one to six for this one? Which one is the least confident? One. <laughs> I'm a one. I'm a one I'm as sorry, well. I'm sorry, I'm a two. A two is what I meant to say. I'll reserve my one for a different match. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go with... <laughs> I'll stick with it too as well. I'll try to hold off on that one. <laughs> yeah, this is by far my least confident just by looking at it. So I'm going with the one. But yeah, that's how we do it to break the ties for the predictions. See who wins. In case we all pick the same shit or have the same matches right, we'll assign confidence points to each match. One being the least confident, six being the most confident. And it's always, you know, depending on how many matches are on the card, that's how many confidence points are the maximum. So you guys are saying two, I'm saying one. I think it'd be nice if we move on from this. You guys got anything else to say from Flair or Rousey? No, that's that wraps it up. Yeah, I agree. All right. So we got the Colossus Omos taking on Bobby Lashley. <laughs> Omos has recently been picked up by MVP as his new client. Lashley defeated Omos at WrestleMania in, I think, six minutes and 34 seconds. Do you see the match going more than that is my first question. My second question, obviously, is who is winning and who really benefits more from winning this? Because in my opinion, Lashley does not benefit from winning this match. He's already beaten Omos. You know, it doesn't really make him any bigger than he is. Omos needs this win to basically stay any kind of relevant. And for MVP and his involvement with Omos to actually mean something. And I honestly think this feud is more about Lashley and MVP eventually than it actually is Lashley and Omos. Omos is basically just serving as a surrogate for MVP to establish himself as that piece of shit manager that just talks shit and interferes and does all that stuff. And that's what I think is going to happen in this one. What do you think, Kyle? Yeah, I, uh, on the similar lines, I feel like oh, the only way that Omos can win this match is going to have to be involvement from MVP. And I just, the only reason I feel that is because that's kind of the story we've been fed. We You had Omos as this un beatable monster for such a long time with AJ and then in comes Bobby Lashley and defeats him in six and a half minutes at WrestleMania even with a possible concussion because <laughs> who knows what happened to Lashley after he got his head smacked on the back of the pole but anyways the the match itself is going to be probably a little bit longer this time eight to nine minutes max but I mean, Bobby's already won the first match and they already won the arm wrestling match. So I feel like the only way Omos can defeat him is with help. So I'm going to say MVP does get involved. I'm going to say that Omos gets the win because of this. And also, I feel like... um even with the beat down at the end uh, with Omos and MVP beating down Bobby, there will might be some involvement with Cedric Alexander. I don't know. It seems like he's still trying to get in MVP's good favor favor. So he might have some involvement. I thought it was weird that Shelton Benjamin was mentioned, but not shown on Monday night raw. So there might be something there too. Who knows? Maybe the MVP and Omos is beaten on Bobby Lashley on after the match in income. Shelton Benjamin to help Bobby Lashley. I don't know. It's possible. Uh, but my bold prediction would be that the MVP announces his return to the ring and his and actually wrestles matches after this and says, Omos, let me show you how it's done. And he challenges Bobby to a match. And it's possible too that that match, if, if that's gonna happen, might be a month away. Yeah, I don't know if they would just immediately have a match next week, but I do I'm gonna go with my bold prediction of MVP actually returning to in-ring competition after this match. What do you think, Chris? Um, with the overall feud, you know, the direction of it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for Bobby Lashley. What else does he have to prove? You know, Omos was so unbeatable and just breaking down everybody and having all them squash matches and this and that for so long and then having against an actual, you know, wrestler and then 
see seeing Bobby Lashley win a uh, Mania in six and a half minutes. It's like, wh- where do we go from here? So it's like, do they bring MVP back, have him turn on Lashley? So overall, I'm looking at it from a wider aspect of things, and I'm thinking about like the whys in it. Like, why why bring MVP back to do that? Yes, Omos very much needs that mouthpiece, but at the same time, it could have been done there. Then then they go ahead and have the arm wrestling, and then Lashley wins that. So for my prediction for the for um, backlash. I'm going to go with Omos is going to win by some sort of interference from MVP. Maybe Omos is in the corner, you know, with the ref and MVP comes by and hits Lashley with the cane. That's a possibility. Cedric Alexander could get involved a little bit. That's another possibility. But overall, I think that uh, Omos is going to win this one and then they'll have their third match and then go on from there and hopefully shake things up and change up this feud a little bit and, Maybe, you know, MVP gets in there and has a match with Lashley because that's what most likely they're going to set up for. But down the line, I just want Lashley to get out of this feud already because I think it's it's getting stale. And this feud with MVP and him has only just begun. So that's what I have to say about it. What about you, Matt? Yeah, I totally agree with both of you. I believe that Omos is going to go over here. He needs to go over. It makes complete sense for him to go over here. And it's definitely going to involve interference by MVP in some sort of way. I like what Kyle was saying about Cedric Alexander real quick on Alexander and the Hurt Business. Previously, when they actually had like the Hurt Business with Lashley and MVP, there was a time where Alexander was tagging with Benjamin and then going to MVP and saying that Benjamin was the one bringing down the Hurt Business in not so many words, but then like the next week they were tagging together again. So I don't know what they're teasing there or where they're going with that, but we've seen sort of some dissension with Alexander and Benjamin before, you know, like we just saw last week on Raw, we had Cedric Alexander in there talking about how he can take care of stuff and showing Benjamin's not there to do whatever, get in his way. Um, so I don't know, man. I don't know if, if Alexander and Benjamin get involved here, but I definitely think MVP does. I think that that's what helps Omos win. I have this as the five for my confidence points. What do you guys have for confidence on this one, Kyle? I got it at a six. I'm I'm 100% confident Omos is going to take this win. Chris? Um... <laughs> Five, six, five, six. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm going to go with a five as well. All righty. So the last question I have for both of you is that six minutes and 30 seconds approximately for WrestleMania over or under that time limit for this match? Oh, that's over. Yeah, I agree. I think I think they'll go just under 10. So in that region of, you know, seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there, I feel that's a, that's where things will end. All right. Well, we're all on the same page with that one. Um, the last thing I had to say about this is that, you know, with these guys that get the giant treatment and come out in their squash matches, just like Gunther's doing, just like Veer's doing a lot of times the, fans don't get to see on TV what these guys actually can do. I've seen Gunther wrestle Mansoor for 17 minutes and look like a freaking star. You were at a house show about a week ago, Chris, and saw Omas wrestle a match. Did he have any development beyond a squash match type of in-ring skill set? Um... Like I said, it, it was a pretty, it was over 10 minute match, maybe under, just under 15. But, um, you know, he got, he got some offense in different maneuvers that I haven't seen him use before. But besides that, um, Reggie actually got some offense in on him and he was taking some hits. Reggie actually was like on his back at one point, looked like he was trying to go for a sleeper and then, you know, almost ended up throwing him off. But besides that, I was, I was just shocked that he was actually taking a little bit of offense from Reggie. So. That was interesting. Well, that's pretty cool that he was in there selling. That means that he can take offense from other guys and go down and not just stand there while people hit him and act like he's the undertaker or something and it doesn't affect him. But um, 
But yeah, I just wanted to see what was happening there behind the scenes with Omos if he's made any growth. Because like with a lot of guys like that, like Veer, you know, I've said this before, I've seen nothing different from Veer on TV than I've seen in dark matches or at house shows where there's no fucking camera on him. They have the opportunity for him to work on shit and he does nothing but no sell and squash everybody. But moving on from this shit, let's go to Corbin and Moss. You guys didn't have anything else on Omos and Lashley, did you? No, I just, I, I really want to see something with Cedric or Shelton. I, I feel like that just will add a nice dynamic to this because it is starting to get a little stale now. Well, yeah, them forming like some kind of new hurt business would definitely be pretty cool because they're not going to have Omos out there wrestling full matches every week. They need other players involved in that little crew that MVP is forming to be henchmen and do some bidding. So having Cedric and Shelton Benjamin would definitely be something interesting that I'd like to see. You got anything else on this one, Chris? Now, nah, besides uh, what you guys are saying with, you know, going ahead with um, Cedric and Shelton, seeing where that develops. But besides that, that's really all I have. All righty. So let's move on. We got a wrestling match here. And the first name of the two wrestlers involved is Happy and Madcap. Now, if you take their last names and you just say Corbin and Moss, it actually sounds like two fighters. You say sounds happy, way cooler. If you <laughs> way say, more interesting. Yeah, you say happy and madcap, it sounds like you're talking about a fucking sideshow at the circus. I mean, but separate from that, we had, you know, the turn on a happy talk segment a couple weeks ago. The crowd was real happy to see Corbin get turned on. That's more of what's, I think, happening here. With Madcap, it's less the crowd being in love with him and more the crowd hating Corbin because he's so good at being hated. I think that overall here, the wrestler that needs the win here to supplant himself in his role is Madcap Moss. We've seen not that great of a build to this match other than some jealousy by Happy Corbin and then a little bit of bold joke telling by Madcap Moss. Corbin takes credit for everything Madcap Moss ever accomplished. Madcap Moss doesn't like that. And Madcap Moss last night told a couple pretty good dad jokes on Corbin. Looked like he was pretty distraught and pissed off almost to the point where he wanted to get rid of his gimmick. And the one thing I'll say about Corbin, other than what I already said, is that we went into WrestleMania with him and McIntyre. Everybody said this match is going to suck. The match ended up being pretty good for what it was, in my opinion. So I honestly think that Corbin will get the most out of Madcap in this match. What do you guys think? Well, I... I think that Happy does need the push, but I think he can get the push with a loss. And I think the reason being is we already know Corbin's a, a major heel. He's a major player as a heel. Nobody likes him. You know, it's pretty easy to say nobody likes Happy Corbin. But I don't think that Madcap yet has got that full audience support. I don't know. I, I haven't been to a live event yet when he recently now after his change or anything like that so i don't know how the audience is truly reacting because obviously when you're watching on tv you it, it's not a hundred percent authentic okay i'll just say that when it comes to audience reaction but i think that madcap could get a loss here and still go over as a baby face depending on how bad happy plays up his heel role during the match and an ends the match with a very heelish move. I don't know what it could be. I mean, it could be involving a weapon. There could be a ref that gets a, uh, you know, a ref bump where the ref gets knocked down and then happy pulls out weapons or maybe even happy takes the trophy and beats mad cap up with his Andre, the giant trophy. And then that really gets some heat on him and gets the audience to hate him so much that after he loses that match, Madcap has got a lot more of that baby face um, 
uh, support because of the beating that he'll take from Happy. So I have Happy winning this one, actually, and I'm pretty confident about that. What do you think, Chris? Um, I'm actually going to agree with you. Personally, I think that um, a beatdown, maybe even after the match on a Madcap with the trophy or a weapon or something, um, I think that Happy Corbin is actually going to win this one. Um, for the main reasoning that, like you were saying, he can go over on a different on a different way of being a, a babyface, and Madcap doesn't really need it right now. I think Happy Corbin will benefit more from the from the win than Madcap as of right now. So that's my prediction for the winner. What about you, Matt? I'm going with Madcap here. I think Madcap's going to go over. I feel like they need him to have a win here to actually make him get some investment from the fans. At the same time, I'm not that confident because of the fact that I think that, I don't think this, I looked it up and I know it, Corbin usually goes over in almost every initial match of a feud that he's ever been in. That's a main feud that's made a pay-per-view. So him feuding with with Madcap here, their first match on a pay-per-view, leads me to believe Corbin's going to win. But I just, given the story, given everything we've seen, I think Madcap's going to win. I think we see Corbin falling deeper and deeper into this hole where he just doesn't want to be what he is anymore. <laughs> And that's what we saw him last night where he just didn't even want to say anything back to Madcap. He didn't even want to lay fists on him. He just wanted to get the hell out of there. I feel like that Corbin's going to lose this match and we're going to see a gimmick change. Um, now Kyle, who'd you say was going to win again? Corbin? Yeah, I thought Corbin was going to win. I'm really glad you brought up that last thing you said, too. The way that the Happy Talk segment ended, where Madcap was telling all those jokes and insults, and Happy Corbin wasn't really responding. He was very quiet. He just had this kind of sad, not even like a really angry, just slightly aggravated look on his face as he slowly walked up the ramp and, and took all those insults. I predict that Happy Corbin it's going to have a character change here. I think happy is going to go away and it's, it's going to be something else, some other adjective Corbin. Uh, I think Madcap's character is not going to change. I think they're roll, They're really running with this Joker character. And I think it's very evident because Madcap is still wearing his stupid trunks and his suspenders. He looks silly, but I thought that was, he was going to drop that when he left happy Corbin's side and he didn't. So I don't think we're going to see any changes from Madcap, but I do feel like we're going to see a big character change from happy Corbin here. What do you think Chris about the character change aspect of it? Um, I think, yeah, a character change could freshen things up, but no matter what he's given, I feel like he's really good at like what he does. Like with that character, he's been put in shitty predicaments with other characters. And I feel like he's like, he executes them really well. And I think he's a good worker too. So I, I have no complaints from his work in the ring and his character work. Cause he's, he's good on the mic. He can, you know, I don't really like the happy talk segment. I think that that can go away with his, uh, gimmick change. So we can get rid of that. Cause that's usually, uh, the part where I use the restroom. So, <laughs> but besides that, yeah. Um, freshen things up. Let's get him a new uh, adjective in front of his, uh, Corbin. Yeah, the thing about happy talk, it's one of those things where I have to make sure that nobody else is going to walk into the room while I'm watching it, or I'll be completely embarrassed that I'm watching this and no, somebody knows about it. But um, At least Madcap had a few decent jokes this week. Yeah. and the, made me giggle, at least. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to say about uh, Corbin's reaction last night, it not only looked like he was sort of like pissed off or like offended, it also looked like he almost was, the gears were turning in his head like, wait a minute. Oh yeah, he's, he's plotting. Well, yeah, but also like, wait a minute. This guy's who I've fucking been attached to with all this joke telling bullshit, I need to do something different. You know what I mean? He almost looked like he was sick of being who he was almost. You know what I'm saying? 
Totally. And, and Corbin's been known to do that too. He's gone through quite a few gimmicks and he himself, if you ever listen to interviews, which I know you have, he said it in the past, he loves playing on a new gimmick and change, changing his character. And a lot of that stuff when he was at his lowest with, with his, like his shirt that was all tattered and, and soiled. And that was all him. Like the, all those ideas were his, it wasn't given to him by creative creative said you go with it. And he, thought of all those things to make him as low as he could so i i'm excited really to see where corbin can go from here yeah it'd be real exciting to see if he can come up with something entertaining um so the last question i have for you guys two questions at wrestlemania we saw mcintyre kick out of end of days do you see end of days being kicked out of in this match and if it's not kicked out of do you think corbin will hit it on moss and then my second question is what are your confidence points on the match i'll go first then chris i've got a confidence level of five this is my second most confident match i'm pretty confident happy's gonna go over here just because i know i feel like advantageous wise his character change needs the win more than madcap's baby face push needs the win so i've you know i've got happy with a or this match with a five i'm pretty confident about it um and that what was the other question i'm sorry will moss kick out of the end of days and uh, yes not, he will kick out of it um yes this is crazy all right so i'm thinking he's gonna kick out of it that's what's gonna make corbin do something very bad in heelish and maybe use that statue uh but i i i do feel like madcap's gonna kick out of it it just happened with drew and i know it's the, the first time we've seen it right because it's been so protected but now the protection is gone it's broken so i i don't see why not all right and Chris, what about your confidence and your end of days prediction? Um, I think that he won't kick out of the end of days. If you have a guy like Drew kick out of it, it's a little more believable. And it's like I know they're I know they're really pushing and trying to uh, build up uh, Matt Cat Moss, but at the same time, I don't think they want to like ruin the fact that how protected it was for for so long. So um, with that being said. I think that's it. That's how he wins it. Maybe hits him with something first and turns around, gets him with the end of days, and that, then for the one, two, three. And my confidence level for this one is a six. I think that Happy Corbin like needs to win for this gimmick change and character change. And we can see that maybe progress during the match, you know, <clears throat> as his attitude and stuff like that changes during the match. All righty. Makes sense, man. My confidence for this one is a four. Um, I do not think Moss is kicking out of the end of days. If Corbin hits that, then my prediction is wrong. I think that having Drew McIntyre kick out of the end of days is something that you do for Drew McIntyre because he's a top guy and you're heating him up here to face Roman Reigns. I think they knew that ultimately, whether it was right now, three months from now, at the UK show next in WrestleMania that they were always going to have McIntyre in some position for Roman Reigns and giving him that kick out of a very protected finish was a way to have him heated up a little bit and look stronger. And with finishes like that, that are so protected, they're not going to have somebody kick out of it unless it's somebody that's either already established as very strong or that they're trying to present as very strong. And I think Madcap is not somebody they're trying to present as very strong. They're just trying to get him over as a baby face in that sort of comedy humor role, which I don't see changing until Madcap reaches a point where he's in the main event conversation, if he ever reaches that point, because there's no reason to not have him as a comedy act if you're a writer. Now, I don't really care for the comedy shicks. I don't think it's funny, but writers love writing for people like that. That'll take the comedy stuff, run with it and spike it in the end zone like Madcap has done. So they'll continue to do this until Madcap is so over that they have to stop. So my final thoughts on that one is Moss is going to go over here somehow. Confidence is four on it. You guys are both saying Corbin anything else on this one before we move on 
But I would just add that I think on paper, it doesn't look that exciting of a match between this two, but I feel like it's actually going to be a surprisingly really good match. How about you, Chris? I think the same. I think this is like the most unpredictable way that the match could turn out. So I don't like, like, I, I think that, um, Happy's going to win, but I think the match is going to go back and forth a lot and they can put on uh, a good match. Yeah, I totally agree with both of you. I think that we haven't seen that much of Madcap in the ring with somebody who's strong. You know, his matches have been with basically people that were jobbing for him. And when we see Corbin in the ring with anybody, it's usually a pretty good fucking match. So... I think Corbin's going to do a good job in this match, guiding Madcap, making them both look great regardless who wins. I think even if Moss loses this match, he will go over more than he already has. Because like we always say, Kyle, it's not about who goes over, it's about who gets over, and you can get over without going yep. over. So yep, Madcap certainly can get over here without going over if they have a match that's actually worth fucking watching because I think that's a lot of fans hang up on Moss is that the in-ring shit's not there and the out-of-ring shit is borderline insufferable sometimes but yeah and that's why psychology is so important not to belabor this conversation but just in-ring psychology will lead you to um the story and the and the character development that you need, not the win or loss of a match. So, you know, as long as happy and madcap are telling the right story in there, you can get somebody over without going over. And if nobody knows what I mean by in ring psychology, you just look it up online and <laughs> there's plenty of definitions out there, but it's really just how the wrestlers are telling a story as they're doing the wrestling moves, what their faces are saying during the match, what, what their different moves mean. Are they doing baby face things? Are they doing heel things? So, so like all of that can lead to the result you want. It's not necessarily the result of the match that will, uh, will that will define the story. So, yeah, psychology is super important here. All right, man. Speaking of psychology, we got two guys who like to wrestle with some in-ring psychology, Edge and AJ Styles. We have Damian Priest barred from ringside after AJ rolled him up in a match on Monday night. A lot of people don't like the way matches end if they end with the roll up. It didn't seem like Edge liked it too much either. He got in the ring before the ref even counted three, attacked AJ Styles. Finn Balor came out, made the save. They had a nice little too sweet moment. This has been building since before WrestleMania, where AJ Styles lost after being distracted by Damian Priest merely standing there at the side of the ring. We also saw a match with Balor and Priest where Balor was distracted by Edge getting out of his big throne. I don't like the direction of this Edge faction because I feel like the presentation is incredibly too heavy-handed, although I know a lot of people also like it. So that's not really where I'm at as far as my analysis on the match. Like, I don't think that has anything to do with the outcome of it. I think that the faction itself, regardless of whether I like it or not, needs to have some kind of continuation and some sort of more build to it than it already has. And I think that's going to happen here as a result of this match. I don't think that Edge is going to win the match. I think that AJ Styles is going to win the match, but I think he's going to take some serious punishment after the match for winning it by whoever the next member of the Judgment Day faction is. I don't see this match being a quick one. I think this is going to take a lot of time, a lot of in-ring psychology, like Kyle was talking about. That's the way Edge likes his matches to be. Edge is given a lot of latitude with what he can do in the ring. I can see this being like a 26-minute match, plotting slow. The story here has been that AJ has an injured shoulder. Can he hit the phenomenal forearm to finish off Edge? I don't know. What do you think, Kyle? 
there's a lot of possibilities with what could happen during this match and after the match. As far, I'll give you my um, prediction real quick. I think Edge is going to win this one, actually. I'm going to differ from you. I think Edge is going to get this win over AJ, and they're going to have one more match to get AJ the win, and it's going to feel that much better once AJ finally beats Edge. But I think what's going to happen here is some kind of um, distraction again. But it's not going to be Damien, of course, because Damien cannot be ringside. He's been barred from ringside. So I think we're going to see the third member of Edge's faction, Judgment Day, show up here during this match. And it's going to distract AJ again, and AJ is going to lose again. And then the third, and then what I think might happen too is that and we might have a run in fest, which is, I love, I don't know about you, but I'm old school. I love run in fests when you just have a bunch of people running in and saving each other. So, you know, after Edge gets this win with a distraction from this other person, um, which I haven't named who it could be, but this other person and Edge beat down AJ, and then in comes Balor to save AJ again, and it's going to give a huge pop from the crowd. We all want to see it. He already saved them once, so we know they're friends, and he, the two of them are going to fight off AJ and this other person, and then because the match is over, then you're going to have um, Damien come in, and then the numbers are going to go into the heels favor where Damian edge and this third person are going to outnumber AJ and Finn. And then possibly the three of them stand tall in the middle of the ring and there's going to be purple lights. And then we're going to see judgment day get bigger. Now as the third person, I think the most obvious thing that everybody's assuming would be Champa here. Champa has been, changed to a heel with his introduction to WWE main roster because he's been attacking Ali um, um, after the matches that Ali's been having. So, and that's Mustafa Ali, excuse me, just to clarify. And so it, we all know Ciampa's doing this sort of thing. It's possible that he's the person that comes in and distracts AJ here. It could be other people, though. My my mind goes in a lot of different directions when I think of factions because I don't feel like you have to necessarily visually fit a faction in order to join it. You know, like Ciampa visually fits. He, he would look the part as far as joining Judgment Day. But it could be anybody, really, that feels like they've been run down or you know they're downtrodden and you know somebody that's been down on their luck it could be a lot of different people personally i I'd, I'd like to see something crazy like jinder mahal i mean jinder mahal has been like floundering for how long now he keeps trying to get his way into different championship runs and different feuds but he really doesn't have anything going plus you got shanky who just broke up with him, if you want to call it that. They're not going to be together anymore. They're not friends. Shanky's uh, going babyface, though. Yeah, exactly. So Shanky goes babyface. So Jinder Mahal is still a heel. Jinder Mahal could join. I know it's really crazy to think of that, but uh, I really think outside of the box here. And it could be something crazy like Cedric Alexander, too, who, you know, is trying to get back in with MVP, but MVP is, you know, not necessarily letting him back in. So it could be a lot of different people. But I, I think for sure the the ending is going to be an edge win. I, I just feel pretty confident about that. But I'd love to hear your thoughts, Chris, because Matt and I differ on who's going to win. What do you think? Um, the winner, I'm going to say, I think Edge is going to win. Um, I think it's going to be some. The third member is going to show up, and it could be Champa. That's what that's what I'm going to go with for now. I think it is going to be Champa that's going to show up. Um, Lights might flicker out, stand up, or he's going to be right there under the, like, not under the ring, but to the side of the ring, just like how at Mania, which I hated that finish. I was there, When I was there, I, I was like, what the hell? You know, they had a great match, I feel like, and it got ruined by the finish. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really too much of a big fan of, like, the whole lights and the whole, you know, purple, like, the purple light thing and the whole darker side of things, but... Man, Edge can work with anything and anything that's thrown to him. And I feel like he has a big, like, creative control on this more than other superstars, especially with who he is. You know, he takes whatever it is, and he's going to go out there and cut the best promo of the night, in my opinion. I think he's amazing on the mic, and he has been for years now. Um, 
But the whole storyline, I, I, I like what you uh, said about how the third member's going to come out, Bowers going to run out, make the save, and then ultimately get beat down by uh, Judgment Day, all three of them standing there, and then lights go purple, and then they'll cut to the prob- – they'll probably cut right after that to the next match or have the promo set up for the match or whatever, or the preview, I mean, to the next match, and that's how we'll go about the show into the next match. But overall – I have Edge winning this one, and then the third match maybe gets finished inside the cell, so no one can actually, you know, <clears throat> get in or out, even though we've seen before on top of the cell spots and this and that. But yeah, besides that, I got Edge going. Uh, I got Edge uh, going over on this one. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I like your Hell in a Cell connection there. Yeah, I was thinking that this is a match that could end up going through the Hell in a Cell as well. As far as people interfering in this match. It's definitely going to be somebody. I actually think that there's two prominent options here. There's Balor coming in and looking like he's saving AJ, but turning on AJ and helping Edge win and beating the hell out of AJ. Or, I mean, that could actually also happen after AJ actually wins the match, Balor comes in, whatever. We also could see somebody like T-Bar, Dominic Dajakovic, we haven't really seen him on TV at all. If you're thinking outside of the box, that's somebody to think about that could join this faction. He could definitely use the reboot. He's a big, scary-looking guy. Um, but who the hell knows? The Finn Bauer yeah, thing. T-Bar is a good possibility. I like that. Yeah, the T-Bar thing and the Finn Bauer thing are the two things that sort of stick out in my head because if they don't do something with Bauer turning on AJ and joining Edge, then... Finn Balor and AJ Styles better be joining up to reunite the Bullet Club shit and do some tag matches because I don't understand why they did that two sweet tease on Monday. But at the end of yeah, the day, that's, I have AJ sorry. with two points here. I just want to say that's why, like, your first option that you were saying, I don't know if that necessarily can happen. Balor turning on AJ this quick just because they had that special moment where the Bullet Club, you know, reunites or whatever, previous leaders of the Bullet Club. So that was way too much of a baby face thing for them to both do the last time we saw them for them to turn on each other so quick. I don't know. Like I, I have my doubts that it would be this quick. I think they have to have a tag team match first with the two of them against judgment day. And then maybe they can separate. But with that, with that being said, where does AJ go after this? He does need somebody to feud with after this. So that that's, you know, once he's done with edge, that is. That's why I think AJ is going to win. Cause I don't see this being over and I don't see, if Edge wins, there's no reason to continue to fight. Edge is beating him with Damian Priest not at ringside. Why the hell does AJ? I think AJ is going to win this match. I think the Balor thing is too early to happen, but it probably will happen down the road. But they will do some tag matches and shit like that. Like I said, I'm sticking with what I um, predicted. AJ will win the match, but he's going to get run in on or beaten to hell by somebody that we don't even know is part of Edge's faction yet, whether that's T-Bar or fucking Shanky or somebody from fucking NXT, who the hell knows. Um, Now, the only thing I don't have is your guys' confidence on this. Like I said, my confidence is two for AJ in this match. What is yours, Kyle? My confidence level, I think I put this one at a four. Let me just make sure. Yeah, I put this one at the four. I'm I'm pretty confident that Edge is going to win this. And uh, before, uh, well, after Chris um, says his rating too, I want to add one more thing to this conversation. But go ahead, Chris. I have this one right in the middle. I have it at a, at a three because I could see it going either way. To, like like uh, Matt saying with continuing the storyline, having uh, AJ pick up the win here. But my overall prediction is that Edge will by some interference, you know, someone standing at ringside and then distracting AJ again, making him look, in my opinion, making him look bad because he's world-class. But um, yeah, I have Edge and AJ, this is right here in the middle for me. It's going to be a three on my confidence level. How many spears do you see happening in this match? Um, Give us two. an over-under. Over-under two. two. I'm going to say two, two or less. All right. What about you, Kyle? 
Yeah, I'll go over two. Does AJ hit the phenomenal forearm? Um, no. I'm going to say yes. Does AJ hit the Styles Clash? No. Did he hit it in the last match? I don't remember him getting it on edge. I think I know he went for it several times. He hit it and got a near fall. Did he? Okay. Um, then he's going to hit it again. All right. So, and you guys all think these will be pinfall victories, not submissions? Yeah. Other than the I quit match? Yeah, pinfall. Yeah. All right. So, this match is pretty much wrapped up. You guys both believe Edge is going to keep going. I think AJ is going to win this one. I think we all think there's going to be some kind of outside interference or distraction or involvement in some way shape or form and to be honest with you i think that's going to be littered all over this card i think that you know other than cody seth which doesn't need anybody else and maybe madcap and corbin i think all of these matches are going to have more of a full segment feel to them in addition to the match have something happening after the match that sort of reinforces whatever the hell the story is that is involved in that match itself to make the feud heated up a little bit more coming out of this unless this because none of these matches are feud enders unless you consider omos lashley that they're all kind of continuations or things that are sparking something so i don't know Let's go on to Cody and Seth, unless you guys had anything else to say about Edge and Styles, did you? Yeah, I just wanted to um, say that it, the conversation uh, uh, in this match is, I think, more about what Judgment Day is doing, what's going on there, you know, less about AJ. And I find it interesting that there's so many different options as far as who might be the next to join judgment day but i feel like the main question you have to ask yourself would be who really needs the help from edge and who doesn't really have a character that is developed enough and i think that's why damien was great for it and you know my guesses of like gender is kind of crazy because gender mahal doesn't really need the help i guess it doesn't really need a character development or anything like that you know a lot of people are saying Rhea might join them i feel like that's further down the line but Rhea doesn't really need that character <laughs> development or push from edge i think she's doing great kind of on her own as long as they get her out of these dang tag teams that keep messing her up but what i saw last episode too i want to point out is dewdrop and nikki ash had an interaction it was nice to see dewdrop and i'll be honest with you i'd love to see dewdrop join judgment day i think she would fit into that group perfectly she'd be sweet i i think she could use the character development the character change and the push and the rub from edge she's getting zero um rub right now from anybody so well i just wanted to add that as a possibility that i would like to see personally well dewdrop and Nikki A.S.H. seemed like they're both changing gimmicks here. I think that was what that scene was all about. And Nikki Cross, which was Nikki A.S.H.'s old character, for anybody who didn't know that, um, was like sort of a psychotic, you know, off the chains woman. So that gimmick, yeah. if they're, they're not going to go back to that gimmick alone because they just don't do that they evolve things they don't go back in time and bring things back um especially these days so i think that we can see a batter ass style of nikki ash in whatever name they decide to give her and we could see obviously dewdrop's already sort of trying to present herself as a badass wearing the leather jacket and being a heel but she her name doesn't you know work and just no, our music either doesn't work the for music that. right so it, they just need to repackage both of them and they both could fit in that i think i agree that the overall you know overwhelming most important thing about this feud is you know extending edge's career here 
having the faction that he's running allowing him to do this stuff that he wants to do with his creative control and i'm fine with that i i like everything edge has done his entire career i just don't feel like we need the magic stuff from him because he's it's beneath him and i also think that sometimes in these promos he goes for the cheap heat where he doesn't need to he's so well spoken behind the mic that he could do a promo without doing the cheap heat that people have heard a million times and still boo at. But at the end of the day, I still think that because it is something that we're trying to build Judgment Day with, I think that AJ is going to win the match to continue it, but get his ass kicked by the third member of Judgment Day at the end of this match. That's just my prediction. I don't know, but I think that that kind of checks all the boxes. It allows the feud to keep going. It builds Judgment Day up. It lets you know that even if you beat him in a match, they're still going to beat the shit out of you. It lets you know that even if you keep Damian Priest out, you never know who Edge already fucking uh, recruited, if you will. So I don't know. Like I said, I'm not that confident. I only have two confident points on it. But unless you guys have anything else to add, let's go to Cody and Seth here. Um, there's not much for me to add. This one speaks for itself. It's going to be probably the best match on the card. Two of the best wrestlers in the world right now. Seth Rollins acting as the gatekeeper for WWE. Cody, we all know his mission is to be WWE champion one day. Cody beat Seth at WrestleMania in his WWE re-debut. He's been doing a great job as the lead babyface on Raw. Lashley's actually a lead babyface, but he's paired with Omos, so it's like, who cares? Uh, so anyway, Cody and Seth here. Seth loses the match at WrestleMania, blames it on the fact that he wasn't prepared, thinks that he'll have a better chance this time being prepared. Going home from Raw, Cody hit the Cody cutter on Rollins, and then that sent Rollins out of the ring. Cody stood tall going home. They've been working house shows almost every dark match since WrestleMania. This is going to be a good match. Even if you have high expectations, it'll probably exceed them. What do you think about it, Kyle? I'm a little um, iffy on the winner of this one. My confidence level is pretty much down the middle. I guess I'm giving you my rating early, but I got a three on it. I, I, I could go either way, in my opinion. I, there, I am ex super excited to see this match, though. I loved the WrestleMania match. And I love both of these wrestlers. I love both of their characters. I love that Cody Rhodes took his um, American Nightmare character from AEW and just transferred it over to WWE. I'm I'm very grateful for that cuz I actually liked that character in AEW and I think it works better over here in WWE. So that I'm loving it and Seth freaking Rollins is my favorite wrestler. I believe I've said it plenty of times, but he's my favorite WWE superstar and uh I I love every match that he's in. They can give me this match 5 times. I'd be happy they can give me this match 6 times. I I'd, I'd like all 6 of them probably. I I enjoy it a lot. They they do have great chemistry too. I feel like the two of them do in that WrestleMania match, they had a lot of instant chemistry like right off the bat they were feeling each other out and they and they had a lot of good communication and they had a lot of monster moves like they were throwing some really high risk um dangerous and difficult to execute moves right at wrestlemania so i would expect a step up both of these guys are step up guys too cody rhodes and seth freaking rollins will not do the same thing twice and they will not do one thing worse uh, after the uh, the other so they're gonna step it up this is gonna be a great match and i think i'm just gonna <laughs> I'm going with Cody Rhodes as far as my prediction. I think Cody's going to win this one. It's going to continue Seth Frickin Rollins' um, aggression towards Cody, and he's going to demand one more match with Cody. And I think also it's going to be a good possible. It's a good possibility to be a Hell in a Cell match coming up. So, and plus Seth Frickin Rollins is like 
born to do Hell in a Cell matches. Him and Edge, I think, are my favorite Hell in a Cell, um, and maybe Under Undertaker. But I, I love those. Better two Better say people. Undertaker. <laughs> well, but Undertaker is like my favorite wrestler of all time. Same. But uh, Seth Freaking Rollins is my favorite current, and I think as, as active wrestlers, he's the best when it comes to Hell in a Cell. Edge, I would give it to as well, but I think Le Edge has lost an edge <laughs> and um, he's, he's just not as aggressive as he used to be which is more required in a hell in a cell match so i see this continuing on with a cody Rhodes win uh, of course it would make sense to have seth freaking rollins win because cody won, won the first one so cody wins first seth wins second and then they have the rubber match at hell in a cell but i think you could still have a third match with cody winning this one because seth is so good at pushing and pushing and pushing and getting his way that he'll probably i don't know he'll lose this one and have a downward spiral and maybe lose a couple more matches on tv then he gets his rematch against cody eventually at hell in a cell so that's my guess. I'm super excited to see it. I'm all like hopped up right now. I was like, ah, I got to see this match. I got to see this match. Yeah, it's definitely worth it, man. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I'm looking forward to this match the most on the card. Um, I love both their work. I think they work great together. The house show that I went to, they put on a great match. Um, actually, it took... He, he's been doing this thing at house shows I've been noticing because I've seen on Twitter that he finished Rollins with um, sort of like the three amigos but he's doing it with the uh crossroads so like he'll do a crossroads pick him back up nice. crossroads and then he'll do a, the third one and then finally get the the pin and i seen him do it at a a smackdown dark match i seen him get the win like that he did I it last night okay so he did it last night so and then i know he did it a couple weeks ago for their dark match and then at the live event that i went to um last weekend he that's how we got the win as well so i honestly see them maybe going in that direction that's why they've been practicing that so much maybe going in that direction with um the ending of the match at the at backlash but crazy for me to say i prediction <sighs> wise this is the one that i've been going back and forth with all week and it's I, it doesn't make sense in my opinion it's tough to have to have to have cody go like cody win here I know he's undefeated right now, but I'm going to have to go with Seth Rollins. And just for the main reason, reasoning is that they're going to have that rubber match. Most likely it's going to be inside the cell. And I think that if Cody wins here, what, what else does Rollins have to say besides, you know, him being mad? He, he blamed the first loss on him not knowing who his opponent was. And he stood by that so strongly that now we're at that second match. Feud's been going. He know he know he knows what he's getting himself into and i think that um seth rollins needs to win here so then when they do finally have that third match most likely at hell in a cell that um cody cody can go over there and the feud can be finished and then they can move on to different storylines all right so with that three amigos style crossroads spot cody hit that not in like the three amigos style, but he hit three crossroads consecutively on Seth at WrestleMania. Over under on crossroads hits in this match, guys. Three. Over. I'm gonna say at three. I'm I'm gonna say if Cody does win, it's gonna be with that with the three in a row that he like he, where he doesn't let go of it. But that's that's if he wins, which me having um Seth Rollins wins, I'd be wrong, but <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm gonna say three or under. All right. And real quick, it sounds like your confidence points on this one's a one. Yeah, this is where my one's coming into play. All right. So does Seth hit the curb stomp in this one, guys? <sighs> yes. For me, I have to say yes, because that's who I'm picking to win. And if he does win, that's how he's gonna get it. Yeah, I think now? I think because uh, Cody's winning this one, I think he's not going to get the curve stomp. I think the curve stomp is going to be how he wins the Hell in a Cell match. All right. So my prediction for this one is going to be Cody going over. I have my confidence points split right down the middle at three because I'm not really that. I don't have a good feel for it one way or the other, but I feel like the way that they're presenting Cody and just knowing Seth for what he is, he's very, 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 very good at what he does. 
He's very good at losing a match and coming out and still being relevant and maintaining the same heat that he had before. He'll figure out a way to play off the fact that he lost and it still be important to him to either have another match with Cody or just to establish himself and maintain his status at the top of the card. So I don't think Rollins needs the win. I think this is more about continuing to build Cody up. Cody now doesn't have the excuse of having the advantage of his opponent not knowing who he is. He's going to beat Seth clean here. Seth won't hit the curb stomp because he protects that very well, although he will tease it a lot. I also think that there'll be a lot of pedigree teases in this match because I've seen that a lot between the two of them. Um, Seth will actually hit a pedigree in this match, but it'll only get a near fall. Cody's going to end up going over in this one. I think he hits the Cody cutter. He'll do the three amigos crossroads like you were saying, and that'll end up being what finishes it. But this has a chance to be the match of the year, considering the fact that they've had time now to prepare for it and they've been working together so much. Any final thoughts on it, guys? Chris, anything? Um, I'm just excited to see where they go from here. You know, I, I, I I think we can all agree that there. This is going to be the match that's going to be inside um, the cell, and I'm just excited to see what what takes place after this. I could have, honestly see both of them being in the uh, Money in the Bank uh, ladder match. So hopefully, one of them win it down the line. I'd be fine with either of them ending ending up winning the the Money in the Bank. But yeah, um, besides that, that's really it. All righty. So we got yeah Chris picking I, Seth. I, Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I had one more thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I agree with like everything you said there. I'm excited to see what happens after. And I was trying to think ahead, like once this feud is done between Seth and Cody, what direction both of those wrestlers go. And I feel like Seth could go in any direction and it works for him because he's just a chameleon. He's just great at doing anything really very well-rounded person. Um, but then I was like, where does Cody go? And, and Cody can't go down on the card, right? So you have to think either of the same level of a Seth freaking Rollins or a higher level of Seth freaking Rollins. And not, you know, there's trying to think of heels that are of that level or higher i would really love to see the next person that gets judged by judgment day be cody i think that would be so cool if judgment day decided to to judge the american nightmare because edge is a level that's high enough uh, a level of wrestler high enough to meet cody's level you know especially the way that they're presenting cody right now uh, other than that matt i know you said it the other day so i'm not taking credit for this at all but you know actually i'll let you take over what you said the other day you think might be cody's next opponent i think cody needs to go through brock lesnar i think if everybody cool. else has had to go through Brock Lesnar, why the hell doesn't Cody? So when Lesnar comes back, he can come back as a heel at Money in the Bank or SummerSlam, whatever he prefers. And then, or be involved in the Money in the Bank ladder match and Cody needs to be able to beat him in some way. And if it is the ladder match that ends up protecting Lesnar, you know, cause it's a six man match and you can get rid of him with some weapons and have Cody win the ladder match. But I do think that Lesnar needs to be on Cody's path to the championship if he's going to do this thing where he mows down everybody and gets to the title. Roman Reigns has taken care of Lesnar, so I think Cody needs to too before he gets a shot at Roman Reigns. But it's all up to logistics and what happens there. But I think that needs to be part of the story. Also, yeah, I like that idea a lot. Yeah, also on Cody Rhodes last night, after the dark match, yeah, he's been doing some really nice stuff with the fans. It seems like he's really happy to be back at WWE. He actually brought somebody out from the crowd, a kid with a It's My Birthday sign, and got him into the ring and had Adam Pierce get all the fans to sing happy birthday to this kid after SmackDown last night. So that was pretty cool. That's special. Yeah. So he's definitely getting over with the crowd. I just think that he's going to win here and Seth's going to 
do whatever he has to do to manipulate his way to continue feuding with him until it's over. I, I view Seth as sort of the same as The Miz in terms of being able to maintain his heat. Obviously, Seth's a thousand times better wrestler than The Miz and a thousand times more entertaining than The Miz, but he has the same quality of being able to, regardless of win or lose, keep the same strong heat he has with the crowd and that's what makes him so great so that's where i'm going yeah, with they're this like one. your your gatekeepers of the of the different cards you know like you your seth freaking rollins is your top of the card gatekeeper and the miz is the mid card gatekeeper and you know dolph ziggler is now the nxt gatekeeper <laughs> yeah exactly now speaking of top of the card we got main event here loaded with guys at the top of the card we got rk bro teaming up with drew mcintyre calling themselves briefly rk mick bro they will be taking on the usos and roman reigns in a six-man tag match with no stipulations attached to it no titles on the line initially this was supposed to be the Usos versus RK Bro in a tag team unification match. There's been some news articles saying that that was never the direction. They were always going to swerve away from it. There's also been reports that part of the reason they changed it is because they felt like RK Bro was too over to be able to take the titles away from them at this time. And the Usos wouldn't be made much stronger by having the unified title belts, as well as the fact that they want to heat up Drew McIntyre without inserting him into a singles match just yet with Roman Reigns. They want to wait until the bigger stadium shows to really sell out a giant show with the RK Bro Usos unification match and the Roman Reigns and Drew McIntyre feud, and I feel like that decision was made after everything got leaked from that taped SmackDown show, and they added a lot of segments taped to that show when they aired it, and that's when they changed their mind to make this a six-man. I don't think that they knew where they were going when they taped it before they went to the UK. Regardless of that, we have no stipulations. I still think that at the end of the day, we're going to get a good match because we have six of the best guys in WWE. I think the least talented or at least the least that I kind of am behind in this match is probably Jimmy Uso, but he's part of one of the best tag teams I've ever seen. So it's going to be a good match. They're probably not going to have Roman tagging in that much. He might do some in the beginning and then get out of the match and eventually take a hot tag. This is a hard match to call, to be honest with you. But what do you guys think about it? Starting with Kyle. Yeah, this is my this is my least predictable match of the whole card. I have no idea because you know why? Because we have zero build. <laughs> we, we, really, there is no build because they took away the build they were making for the last three weeks, which was the tag team championship unification match which we all got behind i feel like most fans i don't know i might be wrong but i feel like most fans wanted to see the tag team unification match and they took it away from us so it's very disappointing i feel like a lot of people feel that have the same sentiment and have the same feeling as me but it, it just makes it very unpredictable because now there's no there's nothing on the line so I don't know what they're fighting for, essentially, for bragging rights. Um, and I don't know what the involvement of Drew and Roman's going to do for this match because this is the first time they've had them involved. So, yeah, extremely unpredictable. I, I like all six of the people that are involved. They're some of my favorite wrestlers. Or, you know, Roman Reigns, we the one. I love the Usos. I like all the stuff that they do. I, RK Bro is very open. On me, Randy Orton's great, and I think Riddle's fun too. I think Riddle's really come into his own, and his character's really solidified now. So I'm I'm happy about that, and he and he's really strong in promos nowadays too. Although he did like mess up at the beginning of his last promo, he messed up like the first word or two or something like that. But um, yeah, it, Drew McIntyre needs some some help getting that push 
to fight Roman Reigns and they're not there yet. So I guess it, it makes sense to do this six man tag team match. It makes sense, but it feels just rushed and inserted at the wrong time. Ever since WrestleMania, everything revolving around Roman Reigns has felt, you know, either rushed or just inserted randomly and made up on the spot. That moment where they had Shinsuke Nakamura come down and get super kicked by the Usos made no sense to everybody at the time because or I'm sorry after that because they didn't do anything with it after that it was one week and then it was gone and I'm glad that they reminded us of it on on Friday night Smackdown and there was a really nice moment where Shin, during Shinsuke's entrance he looked over at Pat Cole or Pat Cole <laughs> Pat uh, McAfee and Ma Pat McAfee was still dancing on his announcer desk like he does during the Boogs entrance and that was nice that was a really nice moment but that's the only thing that we've had referenced for that kick to, Shin to Shinsuke's face so that doesn't make any sense. And then on top of that, you have Roman Reigns holding two titles for both brands, Raw and SmackDown. And I get it if you can't have them defend the titles all the time or have a match on both shows every single week. But I want to see him on a, in, a, in a significant amount on both shows, at least. If you're going to have him travel and be there, like have him do more than just say, watch me on SmackDown. That's ridiculous. No, build a story. Tell me something new. You you you're gonna ha you're gonna advertise Roman Reigns during an entire episode. Say Roman Reigns is gonna say something at the end of this episode, and then he gets to his promo and he says, "Watch me on the next show." Uh uh, that's that's bullshit. So, like, I this build has been horrible. Well, it, it breaks my freaking heart. Man. Well, look, it breaks that, my heart. That's the whole fucking thing. They have a build to. You know, evidently the biggest WrestleMania match ever. Roman Reigns wins the match in 10 minutes. Now he's the biggest champion ever, according to them. Have nothing planned for him whatsoever after fucking WrestleMania. Then you got Nakamura coming out. He gets super kicked off the face of the earth. And then they don't even address that for five fucking weeks while all of us are like, could it be Shinsuke? Could it be this? Could it be? First of all, they should have had somebody ready made and, and to go for this. It's the number one guy in the fucking company who just became the biggest champion ever. So there better be somebody ready for him. And now you got the Nakamura stuff, which was totally misleading. And they seem like they just remembered that that even happened this week, having him back there saying that he hates the bloodline or whatever. And then the one thing I did like about it was I really liked the way that um, Sami Zayn was being a rat and his interaction with um, Heyman and all that was pretty hilarious. But other than that, it's like, what the fuck? What, where is the emphasis on your titles? I understand that there's a lot of people coming up. There's a lot of character changes, a lot of new stories that they had to start at the WrestleMania. But it's your main fucking united, unified champion. What the fuck? Yeah, what is your top tier? What is your top of the card doing on Raw? They don't have a championship to I'll, fight over. I'll tell you what so he's what doing. what the hell are they doing? It, KO's fucking around with Ezekiel, you know? Right. Like, that's what's happening. It's stupid. Roman just keeps coming on Raw after being advertised to be on it all weekend and punts himself to SmackDown. And then on SmackDown, we think that something exciting is going to happen and it doesn't. And that's fucking disappointing. But no, and at least when you had Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar in their most recent feud, at least you had one of them trying to attack or hurt each other significantly. It wasn't just like one. It's so stupid to have three people standing in a ring and then have the other three people not even surprise them. Just have their have Roman Reigns music hit. And then 20 seconds later, the four of them slowly nonchalantly walk out to the ramp and Roman Reigns grabs a mic and acts like he's going to say something. And he just throws his mic down 
minute later they decide to slowly walk up the ramp to the ring how is that building to make haste or yeah exactly like where's the surprise attacks where's like brock lesnar with a freaking forklift trying to decapitate people by shoving it through their car while they're in there like where's all that you know like obviously you can't have mass destruction every single episode but like i don't care about them coming out and slowly walking down to the ramp. That's so stupid. Like zero build to this. And it's almost as it, it just reminds me of the feeling that I had after I watched the supposed biggest, biggest match of WrestleMania ever at WrestleMania 38 between Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. I was so defeated and I was so let down. And I feel that way right now about the six man tag team match. So they better impress me. Yep, they better. So, having said all that shit that we just said, who do you yeah, think? Yeah, Chris, what, how do you feel? <laughs> well, what do you who do um, you, I was going to say, overall, who do you think's winning? Oh, oh sorry. Oh, wait, you, 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 yeah, you can go ahead, Kyle. All right, I'll answer it as quick as I can. I thought that it was going to be the Usos and Roman Reigns, but after the last time they showed us um, that little situation with the he, with the faces standing tall, I think it's going to be the faces. RK Bro and Drew. Who pins who? <sighs> ah, well, now the easy choice would be Drew on one of the Usos. I think it's going to be drew on one of the usos <laughs> i'll give a i'll give it over uh it'll be over jay all right and then your confidence points on that is one. Oh, oh yeah it's a one i have no idea what's gonna happen here but it better be more interesting than just a six-man tag team match and that's it it better be more interesting than, than that paul Heyman, you're so good at nonchalantly putting championship uh titles in the ring during matches you got four of them in your hands during this match i better see one of them get involved yeah so i was gonna ask do you see interference happening it sounds like you do I think I see interference from Paul Heyman happening. Yes. <laughs> Does Drew hit a Claymore kick on Roman Reigns? No. No, wait. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He does hit the Claymore on Roman Reigns. Yes, I'm sorry. Does Roman kick out of a pinfall, or is it broken up by one of the Usos? Um, we'll go with the breakup. Two and a half over under Spears. Under. Two and a half over under Superman punches. Um, over. Two and a half over under RKOs. Ooh, that's a good one. Let's go with, oh, man. Can I go with two and a half? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> let's, let's go with, yeah, like they hit, you know, both the Usos with one and then they go to hit Roman on with an RKO and he pushes off. It's yeah. Something happens. Um, so that being said, I'm going to go under. All right. So Chris, how do you feel about this match? Going into it, I was really looking forward to, you know, the unification match and then, with all that getting changed into this now six-man tag. I think this was announced as the main event, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's kind of underwhelming due to the fact that there's no, there's nothing on the line here, you know? There's no yeah, titles on the line. Championship. Yeah, there's no, um, if, if Drew's team wins, he gets a title shot at Roman. There's, no, there's nothing implicated there. So with that being said, I have, um, <laughs> I have the RK Bro and Drew McIntyre winning. I think that uh, McIntyre is going to claim more Jimmy Uso for the one, two, three, and then maybe a beat down after on um, on the baby faces with the heel standing tall, so that way that the crowd can get Roman's music one more time, and then them walking out with well, still holding all the titles, obviously. And yeah, I feel like that's how it's going to end. But overall, yeah, like you were saying, there's really been no build to this except for the past, what, two weeks maybe? Because for the longest time, we were getting told that, oh, we're going to have the unification match and all this and that. And 
everyone was looking forward to that, especially due to the fact that there's not a lot of tag teams built up in WWE. And these two tag teams are literally carrying the divisions besides maybe the Street Profits as well. And then Alpha Academy, really, they you know, they've really stepped up too. But it's like on SmackDown, who do you really have? The New Day, but you've seen Usos and New Day so many times already. And then maybe what, Sheamus's, Sheamus's group, I guess. But besides that, there really isn't another tag team with um the Viking, the Viking, Raiders, the Viking Raiders being NXT, yeah, with them being on NXT now. So I thought it would have been really beneficial to merge them titles together, not even not even just have them hold two titles for the time being. Yeah, that could have happened on one of the teams and then eventually merge them together. I feel like that would have been a been a good idea. But yeah. So with with that being said, my confidence level for this is a four with the baby faces going over. So then after the match and moving on to Friday night on um, for SmackDown, we could have Drew saying, you know, I beat or I, I pinned your cousin, you know, I pinned someone in the bloodline, you know, I, I think I'm I'm rightfully deserving of a title shot at Roman. So I think that's how it's gonna unfold. Over under Spears, two and a half. <laughs> Um, I'm going to say over. Um, Actually, you know what? Un- under. I'm going to say under for that, over for the Superman punches. That's funny. I wasn't even going to ask you about the Superman punches because he never even <laughs> actually hits anybody when he does that shit. Did you see? Oh, yeah, one? I know. It's just, yeah, Did I see. Did you see last Every night? Time just... They at least could have given us a camera angle where it looked like he hit him. Yeah, <laughs> the one last night was like, oh my god, like he he didn't come close. I mean, I seen it at house shows and uh, you know live, even SmackDown. It's like they they get a good angle, but he doesn't come anywhere close to hitting somebody with that Superman punch. I seen him try to throw McIntyre into the ring post, and McIntyre acts like he hit his head on it, and his head was eighteen inches away from it. But it's funny sometimes when they don't get you know, real snug on something and have to sell it when you see it live. And you're like, man, they're probably pissed that they didn't hit that one better, you know? Or even change the camera angle up like you were saying. Yeah. But, um, cause those guys take pride in that shit. Um, yeah. But so RKO is over under two and a half. Um, I'm going to say under, I'm going to say two. I'm going to say they get what they get them on the Usos and then, they don't hit one on Roman. All right. So you got RK Bro going over. I do too. We all have RK Bro winning this, except Kyle's a little bit weary about it. Um, yeah, just because of that last ending. If you're trying to do, you know. Yeah, the go home math doesn't add up. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't add, it adds up to the Uso. But I think it's, I think Kyle brought up an, or not Kyle, Chris brought up an excellent point. RK Bro is going to win this and then take a beat down for it. So the bloodline's still going to walk out reigning supreme because they're the ones with the fucking championship belts because this match yeah. meant nothing. And then exactly. McIntyre is going to say, wait a minute, I just pinned whoever. And so. I should have a title match. Roman Reigns is going to yeah. say, you didn't pin me, motherfucker. And McIntyre is going to say, okay, well, if you're so fucking great, then let's go. And then that may yeah, lead them to the cell, may- maybe, or, you know, get us to Money in the Bank main event. I don't know. Yeah, because nothing's on the line with this match, so it doesn't matter if the Usos lose. So they can easily lose here. <laughs> yeah, and, and that that's kind of, this is all kind of what I mean about how this is more of like a, pay-per-view that's going to feel like a segment laden show not necessarily the segments like ms tv i just mean the actual match and the pre-match and the post-match all are going to matter and they're all about the story that's sort of carrying that feud more so than just to blow usually pay-per-views are a place to blow off feuds that are happening and i feel like this is more of a continuation or an enhancement to a couple feuds that need the boost like madcap and corbin you know madcap needs a boost edge and styles that's a great match they need a chance to do that again because they're both world-class competitors i definitely agree that edge is probably a little bit past his prime but they can put on a good match. Hopefully it's a little bit 
faster paced than the WrestleMania one. It was well worked. It was just a little bit slow paced. Cody and Seth's going to be great. But my point here is that it's about the stories that are about Cody's story there with Seth. It's about Edge's faction. It's about Madcap. It's about Omos and MVP or Lashley and MVP as far as feuding wise. And then the Flair and Rousey thing, you know, that's about putting us to sleep. But one thing about that match, do you guys think that that's going to end? with somebody saying I quit because they've just been beaten to hell? Do you think it's going to end with them saying I quit because they're in some kind of submission predicament? Do you think it's going to end because they're knocked out? What do you think is going to happen as far as the finish? I think it's going to go with the um, with Charlotte in the ankle lock that Rousey just acquired into remove set. I think that's how it's going to end. Maybe even have like a, maybe a chair involved, you know, and has the ankle with the chair in it and doing it like that, maybe I can see it going like that. And then uh, Charlotte saying I quit there. But besides that, yeah, I don't, that's really, that's really my off the top of the head. That's really what I'm going with. And you definitely think Charlotte's saying I quit. You don't think whoever is relaying the message mishears her or anything. You think it's a clean I quit finish? If, if uh, Drew Gulag doesn't get involved, then yeah, I think it's a clean finish. If he gets involved, then it changes the, the outcome of how the match ends. All right. And what do you got about the finish for Flair and Rousey, Kyle? It's, it's tough to predict how they could end this. I have ways in my head that I thought it would be a good way to get Ronda to win and make it look kind of like um, a shady win. Like maybe Ronda's got Charlotte in a submission and Charlotte says something kind of quiet like, I could never say. And then she says, I quit a little bit louder. Like she says, I could never say I quit. And Drew Gulak only hears the I quit part and he rings the bell. And then Charlotte says, no, I didn't say I quit. I said I could never say I quit. And there could be some shenanigans involved with that. And that could give Charlotte the reason to attack Drew Gulak again and give Ronda the win. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be that fun or that creative, to be honest. I feel like it's just going to be the they're going to beat the crap out of each other. They obviously built that kind of attitude with their last um entanglement where they just beat the crap out of each other even with like six or seven refs trying to hold them down so I, it's going to be a long brutal match and it's going to end with ronda rousey getting the ankle lock on charlotte and charlotte's gonna say i quit and that's what i think is going to happen but i tell you what wwe should hire me because i have much better ideas than what i think they could do <laughs> And still tell this and still tell the same stories too. Hey, look, I've told you that before. You don't have to put yourself over. I've already said you should try out for the writing team because they got eight hundred writers and half the time I don't even know why. I'm not sure what they do. Because some of the stuff just seems recycled and seems like somebody already formulaic. wrote it. Before. Yes, very formulaic. Formulaic. And and that's fine. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. Um I there's two things with this match that I think we don't know yet. I think that on the pre-show they're going to say Gulak is the guest referee or guest something for this match. So he's going to get involved. And then I think that the finish is either going to be somebody getting completely knocked out and so it's you know not really a real finish or it's going to be a situation like you said where the mic that she says I quit in only picks up the words I quit, but she's really saying, fuck you. I'll never quit. You know, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't, I they have to protect Charlotte, even though some people will say, why do they have to protect Charlotte? And I think that Rhonda is just not going to say I quit unless they've paid her enough money where she doesn't care. I just don't yep. see that. But we all know that with this situation, the biggest problem is that Rhonda's miscast. She should be a heel. If she wins this title, I hope she immediately turns heel and says, you know what? I did this after all you motherfuckers are talking shit on me for cutting shitty promos. So I'm going to come. I don't give a fuck about you anymore. And that's her heel turn. And then that's where you get your Lacey Evans or your returning Bailey or whatever as 
your next opponent if Rousey wins this match and, and Flair does go away. But we're going back already all the way to the first match. Let's just uh, wrap up the last match. I have this one. I have Drew McIntyre pinning Jimmy Uso. And I think with the RKOs, we're going over two and a half. Spears over, I think at one point in the match, there will be a spot where Reigns hits a spear on everybody. And that won't be the only time he hits a spear. And I think the Superman punches he'll wipe everybody out with as well. So I think it's over on everything. And then my confidence points on this one are a four as well. So I just think that, you know, we talk about the go-home math, but we've seen go-home math all over the place wrong. Like every time we're like, wait a minute, that doesn't add, and then it's whatever the fuck it is. So I think they're more telegraphing shit or reinforcing shit than worrying about go-home math anymore. But uh, I don't know. I think that at the end of Sunday, we'll probably say it was a decent show. It's just not one where you look at it on paper and say, wow, I got to I gotta see all that. But there, there could be some good stories told here. Yeah, and that's what I'm banking on. I'm banking on the storytelling. And that's what I always do. I always try to give them patience, you know, let the story play out. Hopefully they got good storytelling here because at the end of the day, that's really what matters. That's what makes a wrestling match actually matter and mean something is the story involved. So if they can reinforce some stories, whether they're my favorite stories or not, that matters. And then with the six-man tags, yeah, it sucks that it's not the unification match and that we got the rug pulled out. But at the same time, if it can mean something, if we can have, you know, RK McBro win this one, but still Roman Reigns stand tall and it result in Drew McIntyre getting a matchup with them. That's cool. So there's some cool outcomes to this, but at the end of the day, it's, it is, it, you know, we shouldn't expect it to be great. It's a month after WrestleMania. It's a month after everything they've been doing all year culminated. So, you know, for the longest time, backlash was a good show. I think we were talking about that earlier this week, and now it's sort of like one of the least important pay-per-views, it seems, to them. Um, but regardless, it is what it is. I think it'll be better than at least it looks on paper now. That's my final thought on it. Anybody else have final thoughts before we get out of here? I just want to see where the storylines progress to. And I think that basically this is what this PLE is, just a progression of storylines. So with that being said, that's really much all I have. I'm just looking forward to the future and watching these feuds end out and then move on to bigger things towards the, as the year goes on. There could be some good backstage segments with uh, people that aren't involved with matches here. So I hope to see that, especially with the women's wrestlers. Yeah, that would be nice to see at least some storyline progression and some meaningful backstage segments with Lynch and Asuka or anything involving Belair or maybe Sonya Deville gets some comeuppance for her behavior because they did say that the quote unquote higher ups were investigating her and investigating her as a competitor and she did try to win the match by putting her feet on the ropes and it ain't that hard to investigate it because it's on fucking tv so they should be able to give us an answer on that one but other than that i think that's all we got if you guys have anything else to say go ahead otherwise tell everybody take care and enjoy the show yeah, and uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there, if any of them are listening, for uh, tomorrow and enjoy the premium live event. This is Dr. BGB signing out. See you next time in the emergency room. All right. Thanks so much, Chris, for joining us tonight. Kyle, thank you as well. All right, man. I hope you guys enjoy the event. I hope everybody listening does as well. That's ultimately what I care about most is whether the community is enjoying the product or not. That's why I'm doing this to try to give you something else to enjoy and to also have a little bit of fun on my own. So I enjoy you all being on the journey with me. That's all we got for backlash. We'll be back after backlash to give you a post show on that. Follow us on Twitter at beyond Matt WWE, all podcast platforms beyond the M A T T podcast. That's it. I'm out of here.